Okay, so thanks a lot, Vincent, for the invitation and the kind introduction. And um, welcome, everybody. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, our recent um, uh, the, like our recent advancement in understanding the energy losses in wide gap perovskite solar system, um, concentrating basically focusing on uh, losses happening like at open circuit condition and short circuit condition. And um, since uh, I see this series of talk more has also has a tutorial, I want to brush up on some uh, like basic yet fundamental concept I'm going to use uh, throughout the talk. So uh, as you all know, like when we have a semiconductor under illumination, we have a photo generation of uh, free electrons in the conduction band and free holes in the valence band. Now this carrier population cannot be described anymore by one Fermi level, but we need to describe them using like a quasi Fermi level for electrons and a quasi Fermi level for holes. The splitting of these two levels is what we call like quasi Fermi level splitting. And this is an essential um, quantity that we're gonna use to access the, um, the quality of our semiconductor. And I'm gonna just quickly using like two, two equations, like show you like why this quantity is that important. And the first one is that we can relate the quasi Fermi level splitting to the free carrier density that we have in our device. So essentially like the magnitude of this quasi Fermi level splitting correspond to the density, free density of free electron and holes, which we want to maximize, of course, in, in a solar cell. Uh, the second important relation um, uh, relate to the fact that we can um, express the quasi Fermi level split, quasi Fermi level of electron and holes in terms of chemical potential. And if we have a change in chemical potential of the system, we, ha we have also like a change in free energy. So we can think as uh, the quasi Fermi level splitting has the amount of free energy that uh, we can gain upon an extraction of an electron hole pair from the system. And then if this change in free energy is in the form of electrical energy, so in electron volts, basically this uh, relates to the VOC of your solar cell. So this to say that like the quasi Fermi level splitting is a direct measure of the POC of your device. Now, if you have like an ideal case where the only recombination process that is happening in our device is the recombination of electron and holes through the gap, band gap, uh, through a, like a radiative process to an emission of the photons, this, uh, this situation uh, basically represent like a radiative limit. So an ideal scenario, and the magnitude of the quasi Fermi level splitting in this scenario is what we call like the thermodynamic limit. So it's the maximum splitting of the of the of the quasi Fermi level, and we cannot basically we cannot overcome this uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, this limitation. Now, in a more uh, realistic scenario, like our semiconductor, we have some uh, defects and trap which will. Um, act as no radiative recombination centers. And uh, these will act as a, like a, an additional non radiative recombination path, which will decrease further the density of electron holes in our system. And as a consequence, we'll reduce the splitting of the quasi Fermi level. Hence, we will have like a lower VOC. Now, uh, on top of that, uh, we have also another type of recombination channel that can happen across the interfaces between the perovskite and the transport layers. For example, here we can have a recombination between an electron and uh, in the in the ETL and a hole in the in the perovskite absorber. This is like a, another recombination channel, what we call like interface recombination. This is also like a non-radiative process, and this will decrease again like further the, no, the the amount of free carriers that we have in our device, and will decrease uh, further the VOC. Now, um, we will focus particularly on these processes that can happen like at both interfaces. Now, uh, ideally, we, we said that the, the internal quasi Fermi level splitting should be equal to the VOC that we have in our device. And uh, we, we see that, uh, that both quantities can, are influenced by non-radiative recombination processes. So if we want to study the uh, recombination mechanism that is happening in our device, we should be able to access these two quantities. Um, while we can access the VOC quite easily connecting our device like electrically and measure the voltage, uh, the quasi Fermi level splitting is a bit more tricky. Like we cannot really directly access, access it like um, with, um, with an easy experimental technique, but uh, there's an easy way around it. And uh, by using the photoluminescence quantum yield, uh, we can uh, find a way to access this quantity. If you focus on these, um, this relation here, we can express the quasi Fermi level splitting in terms of photoluminescence quantum yield, uh, the generation carrier, and what we call this J0 rad, which is like the 
a minimum amount of radiative recombination that happens in the dark in our device. I don't want to go like in too much details here, but I just want you to focus on the fact that both the quasi Fermi level splitting, uh, sorry, the uh, photoluminescence quantum yield and this J0 red are two like easily accessible quantity. So we can directly measure the PIQI of our system and the J0 red can be just calculated using an EQE of a, of a solar cell. So um, the beauty of this technique is that it's a fully optical characterization method. So in order we can access the quasi Fermi level splitting, not necessarily having like a full device stack, but we can also just measure like uh, the need absorber just in contact with, with the glass is what we define like as a, as a neat uh, has a neat material basically, or in contact with either the uh, HDL or ETL interface in order to disentangle the contribution of in mean, recombination of the two interfaces or in a full device stack. And we will use this approach quite extensively. Now, um, if we consider that this uh, radiative uh, situation, this ideal case where only char charges can only recombine through radiative processes, and we have, uh, we consider now a couple of um, ideal assumption as like perfect like charge extraction or perfect generation above like the, the band gap of the material, we can calculate the uh, single junction thermodynamic limit in terms of efficiency that our devices can achieve. Of course, uh, you can see that like this depends on the band gap. And even when we have like an optical band gap around between like 1.2 and 1.4, uh, the efficiency of the solar cell of a single solar cell, we cannot like overcome like 35%. However, there is a trick to overcome this limitation, and it's basically by just by stacking two solar cells with different band gaps on top of each other. Uh, in case, when, if you want to do that with like full perovskite, um, we have usually narrow band gap perovskite with a band gap of around like 1.2 eV, and wide gap perovskite with a band gap of 1.8. When we combine these two, as you can see here, you can we can have like PCE that like they're above like 40% theoretically, of course, in the ideal case. And, uh, and this is due to the fact that uh, combining the two um, devices with different band gaps, we have like a broader absorption of, of our solar spectrum. In this talk, we will focus on the wide gap pairs, get or the 1.8 dB. So uh, if we look at the um, 1.8 dB solar cells, uh, pairs get solar cells, we can immediately notice here from these uh, the collection of different uh, PIN cells uh, that the VOC, as soon as we move uh, further right from the 1.6 EV uh, device, which is like what we consider like a standard band gap, we observe like a quite a strong limitation of the in the VOC. So we have a sort of like a, a saturation of the VOC or a pinning of the of the VOC to values like of around like 1.2 uh, volts and. Um, the origin of these losses is usually uh, usually attributed to the fact um, that um, we have uh, intrinsic issues in the in the perovskite material. So either like a large trap density or interesting instability of the of the system because we have um, a larger amount of bromide that is usually used to achieve such uh, such band gaps. Um, arguably, these are the only losses. We'll show that like this it can be like uh, another type uh, of of picture actually here. And just as an example, like to show like what where we at basically of this system, uh, we see that like this is uh, the the wide gap perovskite that has been used for I, I believe it is still like the current record for all perovskite tandem. As you can see that like here for example they have a one point uh, around one point eight dB cells with a, we still with the VOC around one point two volts. So meaning that we still have room for improvement here just on the wide gap uh, perovskite and the the whole perovskite tandem as well. Um, I want to focus here on uh, during the talk of like the losses that happens in this system at two operational condition. Uh, the first one is the losses that happen at VOC condition, so where we have like no extraction of charges and uh, and all the recombination processes that are happening here will directly influence the VOC of your device. And um, the second uh, the second operational condition that we're gonna focused on is like a JSC condition. So where in this case, on the contrary, we have like full extraction of charges or ideally we should have full extraction of charges and no recombination process is happening. And in such a case, like any loss or that we, we observe at this condition would influence the JSC of our device. Now, uh, before uh, going through like new results, I wanna quickly uh, go through what we have learned like recently um, 
the, regarding like the losses at open circuit and short circuit condition in this system. Um, this, uh, this is a recent uh, publication where we choose like a 1.8 TV model system perovskite and we modify the perovskite itself using an ionic additive inside and, uh, and we improve further the interfaces using uh, lithium fluoride. This we, we decided to, decide to work on this system mostly to investigate the improvement in the VOC and to understand the losses that, uh, that, are, that are related to uh, these such devices. So um, here we used this PIQY method that I showed before. So we um, had a look at the PIQY of the NIT material and, and we compare basically the, the potential of the PIQ of the NIT material with, when, to the perovskite when it's in contact either with the HDL or the ETL. And as you can see here, like in PIQI and in also in quasi fermi level splitting, uh, when the perovskite is in contact either with the PTAA or the C60, uh, the PIQI and the quasi fermi level splitting is like strongly reduced, indicating that in such system we have like strong losses due to interface recombination happening at both interfaces. And um, here we, we, we found out that when we use the ionic additive inside, uh, both interfaces can like optimize basically, and we can like push the quasi fermi level splitting higher. Uh, these have been also confirmed by uh, thymosol photoluminescence, which showed like the same trend and highlighted also how the lithium fluoride can push and optimize the C60 interface uh, even further. But interesting here, like when we looked at these devices, even though like they're quite optimized and it can reach like quite high VOC, when we compare like the quasi fermi level splitting and the VOC of the same device, we found out that in all cases, um, there was um, quite a large mismatch between the internal quasi fermi level splitting and the external VOC. And so we even optimized devices that we suffer from this uh, quasi fermi level splitting uh, VOC mismatch, uh, meaning that we still cannot achieve the full potential that our perovskite will be able to deliver basically. And uh, to understand the origin of these a little bit better, uh, we perform like a UPS measurements on a sequential deposition of C60 to basically reconstruct energetic alignment at the ETL interface. And here we found out that in all cases, uh, the ETL present a quite uh, substantial energetic misalignment uh, between the conduction band and of the perovskite and the luma of the C60. And these uh, we know from like previous studies as it can cause um, uh, a substantial uh, quasi fermi level splitting VOC mismatch. Um, to clarify a bit this point, um, so um, I, I, I've, sh I've shown like at the beginning that the quasi fermi level splitting and the VOC should be, I, should be identical like in theory. However, we can have a case where we have like strongly misaligned layers, for example, uh, that we have a constant basically injection of carriers from the perovskite to the transport layers. And due to this energetic offset, we cannot have reinjection basically. So we ended up with a strong and large uh, density of uh, of majority carriers here in the in the transport layer, which can recombine with the with the minority carriers present in the perovskite. And such a scenario would constant would, would create like a constant depletion of free majority carriers in this case in the perovskite, causing the bending basically of this quasi fermi level splitting. And uh, Similarly, we, have, we can have like a similar process, like the, the effect is it's, it's the same, but uh, we can have it even though if we have, uh, for example, um, um, poor selectivity of the contacts. So this is like a, like a possibility that we can have in our devices. Now, in terms of like JSC losses, um, here we refer to a publication, recent publication by Yarl. I think she presented these things in the same, uh, in the same, uh, in this very same series, like a couple of months ago. So some of you might be already familiar with the work. And uh, here they investigated, especially on lead tin perovskite, and uh, they um, essentially like monitor the evolution of the JSC over time, in the first like few few seconds. And what they found out that due to like an ion, internal ion redistribution in the perovskite, uh, we will end it up with a sort of like a, um, internal, uh, internal field screening where uh, the charge extraction gets, um, gets limited after a few seconds and the JSC basically will, will decay. Now, this study was done on, on lead tin perovskite, but they also showed this is quite like a universal, uh, universal process, basically. So universal limitation for different type of perovskite and also for our 1.8 TV. So essentially, we know that like the JSC can be limited due to like this ion screening of the internal field, 
and a limited charge destruction. So now, based on this knowledge of these, essentially like these two important studies, uh, we moved on, sorry, we moved on into understanding a little bit deeper these type of losses in, the, in these uh, wide gap system. And uh, first of all, like we have to consider that most of the time, like the, these wide gap system, or like the say these periscope solar cells, the, the ETL and HL are optimized for 1.6 EV uh, devices, which is like the standard ones. When we increase the band gap of this material, we will end it up necessarily with like a, with a, with an um, energetic misalignment between the transport layer and the perovskite. So such a case can influence, of course, the VOC as we've seen before. So uh, we perform some drift diffusion simulation, looking at, uh, looking at the evolution of the VOC depending on the on the perovskite band gap. And uh, in two cases, basically, in one case uh, here, the purple one, by constantly aligning the transport layer, so basically simulating uh, like always such a scenario by increasing the band gap. And we've seen that the VOC increased linearly as we would expect by increasing the band gap of the perovskite. But um, when we simulate a case where we keep the transport layer uh, that are optimized for a 1.6 CV cell, we see that the VOC start to be deviates from this linear increase and start to be like saturated to lower values, increasing more and more the, less, the losses, the more we increase the band gap, which is something very similar to what is usually uh, observed experimentally. So um, we went a little bit deeper here in understanding the, the losses of this interface by uh, um, going on with some um, other simulations. And uh, here, we just wanted to have a look basically at the, at the specific interface or a misalign when, when we have like a misalign transport layer. And if you look at the carrier density profile that we have here, uh, we end up with a very large electron density in the electron transport layer, and uh, which can recombine with a fairly large uh, density of um, holes here in the perovskite. And these would give rise to um, quite a large recombination current. Now, such recombination can be described by shockley ridol formalism. And uh, we know that if we have a recombination across this interface happening between uh, like unbalanced carrier density, so in this case, large electrons, large, large density of electrons with like a lower density of holes, the rate of this recombination will um, depend almost exclusive, exclusively on the minority carriers, so the holes. So um, having this in mind, we try to simulate uh, like an artificial kind of like system where we have the perovskite itself that we have a, with a surface that is modified in a way where we can decrease the hole density in the proximity of the um, electron transport layer interface. And as you can see here, despite we have still a very large electron density in the, in the, in the ETL, we have a very low or much lower hole density here in the, in the perovskite, and this would give rise to a much, much lower recombination uh, happening at this interface. And uh, if we look now um, at the relation between the quasi fermi level splitting and the VOC in this system, we can see that like the reference devices, they have like a rather limited VOC with a large quasi fermi level splitting VOC mismatch, whereas like in the optimized device, we end up with a much higher VOC, which now matches the, the internal quasi fermi level splitting. So this is like all simulators, but like it's, it started like, like we use these as like a motivation kind of like to optimize our devices. And now uh, what we did here, we try like many different uh, type of optimizations. And um, essentially we focusing on the ETL uh, interface, we modified the perovskite surface using uh, either guanidinum bromide or imidazolium bromide as surface modifiers, or uh, we, uh, focus on the H HDL interface by in, in like inserting like a, like an ionic interlayer between the PTAA and the perovskite. So basically like treating the PTAA surface or replacing directly the PTAA with a self-assembled monolayer. Now, these can give rise to a lot of combination of devices. And uh, sorry, this can be like a bit overwhelming, but I just want to guide you through like few like main important points here. Uh, so, um, the first thing that we, we, we observe is that they're treating the PTAA with this ionic layer, the TA, TFSI, most improve, improve like the JSC and the field factor of our devices, of course, like pushing up also the, uh, the, the PCE. And whereas like treating like the top interface with guanidinum bromide or imidazolium bromide, mostly push up the, the VOC 
which is like quite nice, quite, quite nice VOC and, and resulting efficiencies. So then from here, we try to um, basically combine the optimization at the bottom interface and the optimization at the top interface. But unfortunately, in this case, with PTAA, we didn't really have successful results. Um, so we decide to uh, change basically the, the PTAA layer, layer with a self-assembled monolayer. And as you can see, like immediately just switching from PTAA to the SAM, we have like a big improve, improvement in the VOC, the JEC and the field factor. So basically all parameters like went up. Uh, but in this case, uh, what's interesting is that if we can also optimize the top interface with either guanidinum bromide or imidazolium bromide, we can push the VOC much higher, like um, uh, the surpassing 1.28 volts, which is quite good for, for this type of devices and field factors above like 80% and resulting PC of like 17%, uh, which is a nice combination of, uh, of both like um, HDL and ETL uh, interfaces improvement. So basically, from this combination of, of, of improvement, we could uh, understand, we could find out that the, the guanidinum and the midazolium bromide they effectively improve the VOC of the device. And uh, the TA TFSI uh, could mostly like improve the field factor and the JSC, whereas the SAM uh, could like, basically push up like all parameters at the same time. And when we combine our best HDL improvement with the best ETL improvement, essentially we can get like our, these are our like record devices where we have like a stabilized like PCE of like 17% and field factor above like 82 and very high uh, open circuit voltages. And um, the nice thing of this type of improvement that like if we move from a, what we call like small area device to a large area device, we could basically maintain almost all the same uh, parameters. So we have like still field factor above like 80%, again, like PC around like 17. And, uh, and uh, in this case, like VOC is the uh, 1.29 volts. So we could really push the, the efficiencies of this device quite nicely. And in terms of understanding here, like the VOC was quite um, straightforward, let's say, like it's, or let's say expected to see all these improvement in VOC. Uh, what was a bit surprising was to see the improvement in short circuit current is it's uh, upon this uh, interface optimization. So here we did, we don't really have a change in band gap. We don't really have a change in absorption. So the, the improvement in short circuit current that you see, they must come from something that is related with the charge structure in our device. So to investigate this further, basically we adapted the same approach that um, that has been used in that publication I, show, I showed earlier, like for, for Lantean devices. And, and we basically, we monitor the evolution of the JSC over time. As you can see here, these are like, like average uh, between like, among like multiple devices, the PTAA devices, they always show like a quite substantial like loss in, in a short circuit current over time. Whereas when we treat the PSK with the, with the sorry, the PTAA with the TEA TFSI, or when we use the SAM, this loss gets like significantly reduced, which is indicates that it's something, again, the improvement in JSC is something related more to the charge destruction. I will go back to these, uh, to these expert, to these uh, results later to explain a little bit more uh, in details. So now uh, we went on like to characterize a bit all these uh, different device optimizations. And uh, first of all, from just looking at the SEM, we can see that the pairs get when it's been coated on top of TA, TFSI, or SAM, it already pre presents like a better morphology. But most importantly, when uh, we look at the at the at the top view of SEM of when we treat the pairs get with guanidinum bromide or ibidazolium bromide, we see that there's like a clear uh, sort of like recrystallization of the surface. So it really um, something we are like really modifying something at, at the at the periscope when we spin coat these these um, these molecules on top and uh, then of course if we look more uh, like um, specifically at what's going on at the surface we we were using uh, xrd we found out that the use the, the use of guanidinum bromide and imidazolium bromide always uh, results in appearing of these additional periscope phases here this is like an example for the for the SAM, but it's it's um, it's um, yeah it's observed like in in all in all cases. And if we go a little bit um, deeper here in the with the XRD analysis, we observe that in all in all in all uh, cases where we have like PTA, TA, or SAM, we always observe in the terms when when we use like guanidinum bromide 
corimidazolium bromide disappearing of like low dimensional phases on top of the perovskite, which is being um, also confirmed by GWAX measurement, which they show like no real preferential orientation of these new phases, but it, we confirm like uh, having like low dimensional phases on top of the perovskite in all in all conditions. And um, now, in order to understand a bit what the what these uh, this optimization did in terms of non-radiative recombination, uh, we used the approach that I introduced before. So we studied basically the photoluminescence quantum yield of the devices uh, of the material, like the neat material, or in contact with the HDL or the ETL, and we can see that already in the neat material, guanidinium bromide and imidazolium bromide they pushed uh, the PIQI to higher values, indicating that the act has an effective like surface uh, passivation already in the neat material. But most importantly is when we have the perovskite in contact with the transport layers, in both cases, the, the, the best, let's say the best uh, interface optimization, which are like the imidazolium bromide and the self-assembled monolayer, we get uh, to PIQI values, which are really close to the, the one of the neat material itself indicating that now interface recombination is not really a major loss anymore. And um, this was like quite important, but um, more important is if we look now at the relation between the quasi fermi level splitting and the VOC of our devices, uh, we could observe that basically as um, in, the, in the reference device, we have like quite, let's say limited VOCs and a large quasi fermi level splitting VOC mismatch, as you can see here. But when we, we move to the SAM case, uh, we observe that in the, the quasi fermi level splitting VOC mismatch is completely reduced when we have like a full optimization of the interfaces of the device. And if you remember from the initial simulation, this is, it's, it follows exactly what we, we predicted that you would have when you have like an optimized device. So we, we move from like a large uh, quasi fermi level splitting mismatch for a reference to like uh, elimination of a mismatch for like uh, an optimized fully optimized device and um, in terms of uh, photoluminescence uh, time resolved photoluminescence uh, these the the, um, the trend um, follows uh, exactly what we observe from photoluminescence quantum yield has as as it should be and um, and so it basically we have uh, you can see that like in the neat material with the imidazolium bromide we have uh, let the lifetime get pushed up like quite substantially reaching almost like seven microseconds which is quite long, and uh, but um, again like more interesting like when we look at the two interfaces uh, we can see that like when we use imidazolium bromide the lifetime gets really close to the one of the neat material. And in the in the case of the SAM, you, you can see here that like the two lifetime and uh, and are basically exactly the same. So we have almost zero losses induced by these uh, new interfaces. And from the lifetime itself, you can calculate also the surface recombination velocities. As you can see here again, that like the surface recombination velocities that are calculated for the inter for the optimized interfaces approach the one of the neat material itself. Again, indicating that. Uh, in these devices, uh, the like the interfaces are almost like um, let's say they, they don't really induce like a strong recombination channel anymore. And uh, now this was uh, about like the VSC, but what what about like the JC um, this JC improvement? And uh, here we decided to approach this from uh, um, quite like a, maybe with an unusual uh, characterization method. And uh, so we decided to record like PL maps on under of, of a full device under open circuit and search circuit condition. And this is why this, we did this because like mm, at open circuit condition, you should have like full recombination of charges and like a certain like amount of PL like emitted from your device. But at short circuit condition, ideally you should have like a full extraction of, char of carriers and you should have like almost like no PL uh, we found out that this is not the case, that you always have some residual PL, even in short circuit condition. And basically by comparing the amount of this residual PL that it's, that it's still like remaining in the device, we could access like the, the quality of the charge collection that we have from our device. So we could basically reconstruct uh, these, what we call like charge collection quality maps, uh, where 
we can basically like learn, I would say like two main things from, from, from this map. One is, it, this is like quite larger because it's like, this is like one million. So like, it's like three millimeter by three millimeter. So we can learn something about like large scale inhomogeneities, for example. And you can see that the PTA will really suffer from some regions where like the extraction of charges is really, really low. So this is something maybe related to like the how you process your device. It's more like, yeah, something related to like structure like um, defects or whatever when you when you when you build a device but um, we can also see that like generally like when even when it gets more homogeneous uh, the the efficient the extraction of your device when you have like multi ATFSI or the SAM the quality of collection gets like nicely improved and uh, these again like follow uh, very nicely the, the, the like this JSC decay uh, that we observe like uh, in a, in a, in the in the full devices. So the same trend is basically um, the the two measurements they qualitatively agree. Now uh, to understand a bit better what's going on here in charge extraction and why some devices type of devices extract like more than the others, we decide to perform some other drift diffusion simulation. In this case, some transient uh, ones, and so we manage basically to replicate the same trend in JSC decay that we experimentally observe. So the PTAA, we have like quite a substantial decay. Then the TA, TFSI is less pronounced and with the SAM is almost reduced. But now having this in a simulation form, we could also have a, have a look at like how the building field evolves like inside the perovskite. Um, and so uh, here we have a look, basically, this is the thickness of the perovskite. This is the HDL interface. And basically here we're going to have a look at the change in the in the um, in the internal potential of, of our perovskite of our solar cell from the from the bulk to the hdl and we can see here that like in, for example in the ptaa case we have almost like no change in internal uh, in the internal potential uh, across the layer but like almost all the potential drop across uh, across the um, the whole transporting layer Whereas in the SAM case, in the TA TFSI case, we have like a change in potential already like in the perovskite. And if we um, then have a look at the same picture, but in terms of like ion densities, we see that like in the terms of uh, on when we have the PTA, we found out that most of the ions uh, are, are actually like accumulating in the HDL. So they can diffuse in the HDL and accumulate there. Whereas where we have like a ultra thin SAM, or like we have when we have this ionic interlayer as a TA, TFSI, we have an accumulation of the ions within the perovskite bulk or at the interface actually, but not in the HDL. And if we look at the evolution here at the VBI basically, so the, uh, the internal field at Schroeser condition, we can observe, first of all, that in all cases, we start with a certain field drop and then due to the ion redistribution, all in all cases, we, we ended up with almost like flat bands in the perovskite bulk. And this was already quite surprising for us. And the only difference that we could notice is that this like remaining field here at the proximities at the HDL interface, that is basically what, what we observe here. So this is the only difference and, 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 and apparently is enough to change uh, drastically the, uh, the decay of the, of the short circuit current. So we ended up with such a situation, basically, just to schematically represent that, that in the um, in the um, in the PTAA case, we have an accumulation of ions in the in the in the HDL, where this would cause like a field drop across that layer and 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 flat bands in the perovskite, whereas like in the in when we have like this ionic layer or the self-assembled monolayer, we have a, like um, accumulation of ions in the perovskite and the resulting field. Uh, that it's maintained in the perovskite, we can help and can help and promote the, the charge extraction. So um, lastly, just quickly, I wanted to uh, show you like, some stability data of these, of these devices. And uh, just to point out that basically here, we check like the, the effect of the guanidinium bromide or the imidazolium bromide uh, in terms of stability. These are like thermal stability of, of, at 85 degrees. And so, as you can see, like the, um, compared to the reference SAM devices, the guanidinium bromide made the stability actually worse. So like the, this, the, the, um, the devices themselves are like less thermally stable. And on the other way around, the midazolium bromide actually helped the stability. Some of the devices still survive like more than 1200 hours at 85 degrees. 
And if we look at the parameters that goes wrong, kind of, it's the it's mostly like the VOC that uh, in the case of the guanidinium bromide is not really maintained. And looking at the at the at the the film the film itself stability, we found out that it's it, in, in, even in air stability, the guanidinium bromide is much less uh, stable compared to the midazolam bromide that uh, show like basically unchanged absorption profile over uh, 15 days in air. So this just to point out that not all the optimization, like not, not all the optimization that are good in the device are necessarily like a, like a definitive solution because you also need to consider if they, if they actually can survive like long time or like, or more like harmful and stress condition. And um, so here, like to conclude, basically uh, we found out that in these devices, the JSC is mostly limited by the ion screening and the charge destruction of our device. The VOC or the other way around is limited by um, the energetic misalignment with the transport layer and the quasi Fermi level splitting VOC mismatch. Uh, we found out that the optimizing the HDL uh, mostly improved the JSC of our device and helped like the charge destruction, whereas like improving the, the, the ETL mostly improved the, the VOC of the device. And the combination then of the, um, the optimized ETL and HDL interfaces give rise like to uh, very high voltages in our device. So, and has a probably like main take home message here is that um, these wide gap devices are not necessarily limited by the material itself. And that if you apply like, uh, like quite appropriate like device engineering and the selection of the transport layers or optimizing the interfaces, you can really access uh, the full potential that the periscope is able to, to deliver. And if we now look at the initial plot, when we plot like our devices on top, you can see that like the losses, the VOC losses now that our devices show are like comparable to, to, to the normal losses of narrower uh, band gap uh, periscope. And just before uh, going to the announcement, I just want to quickly mention that uh, for the past few years, I've been uh, like scientific advisor of this newly founded like startup company in Berlin. And they produce, uh, I, we help basically uh, um, optimizing and, 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 and conceptualizing these uh, PIQIs, small and like compact PIQI setup. So if anyone is interested in having like similar measurements of what I've shown before and, and even much more actually in a more like plug and play method than rather than having like a big optical setup, uh, you can get in touch with me or with the guys in Berlin here. And um, now I want to just to conclude, like thanking um, like all my uh, group in Oxford and for the help of all like my colleagues and my former group. And like, we're still currently collaborating together and uh, the funding agency. And of course you for your attention.